Hi, uh, I'm Madeline Holly Rosing, and I'm the creator writer of the Steampunk Supernatural series, Boston Metaphysical Society. You can find me at uh, www.bostonmetaphysicalsociety.com and also on Kickstarter right now for our volume two special edition hardback. And any place else on social media, just type in Boston Metaphysical and it will pop right up. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industry. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. She has been on the show many times in the past, doing such amazing work with her truly supernatural comic series as well as an audio production boston metaphysical society we're joined by the ever talented madeline holly rosing how are you doing today i'm doing great thank you so much for having me on the show kurt i really appreciate it well it's been far too long since you were last on i i was thinking about i know it and it was like i know an audio I, drama was the last time we chatted yeah that was that was a few years ago and you know a lot has happened then we did finished production on the audio drama and got that shipped out to Kickstarter backers. And in fact, it's it's available to download pretty much on any of your favorite podcast platforms, uh, though you can get the CD and a flash drive uh, directly from me, if particularly if you like a higher quality sound, because for those of you out there who don't know, um, this was a full cast uh, complete production with uh, audio engineer, music, everything. It's like your old time radio play. And so if you really like high quality sound, I recommend the CDs if you still own a CD player. <laughs> I, I'm sure it'll come back in 20 years if you don't own a CD player, you know, just borrow your parents' car or yeah. something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oddly enough, some of these, they do come back. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, because they haven't seen, of course, your amazing work with Boston Metaphysical Society, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to the show today. I, as I mentioned, is I'm the writer-creator of the Steampunk Supernatural series, Boston Metaphysical Society, which is a graphic novel, prose, and audio drama uh, series. And... Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, it's about an ex-Pinkerton detective, a spirit photographer, and a genius scientist who battles supernatural forces in late 1800s Boston. We started with a six-issue miniseries with art by Emily Hugh, and then did four standalone sequels. Uh, along with that, I wrote a prequel novel and a prequel anthology and an audio drama. Uh, we are currently halfway through our new, new series, Pike's Peak, and we have a, a, a change up with the, with the artist, which will be announced shortly. Uh, so we will be continuing with that series. And in the meantime, this year, I've done a Kickstarter for a special edition hardback of volume one. And the current Kickstarter is for a special edition hardback of volume two. Well, talk about the hardback because it, it's obviously you have a, an amazing cast of characters. Uh, you've, enjoy the uh, world that you've built. I've enjoyed reading it, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but why did you want to go hardcover for these latest two issues? Actually, it was a fan demand. Oh. I, I kept getting asked at conventions and other places, okay, when you, hello, hardback, hardback, because they want, because a lot of people, they read the trades, so that gets bent up, mm -hmm. but they take the hardback and they put it up and it looks all pretty on the shelf. That's true. And that's, that's a display copy. <laughs> And then the trade paperback is the, the reading copy that everyone can can pass around. So, uh, you know, it was just, you know, we've been around for about a decade and it was it was time. It was really time to do a hardback. The volume one hardback came out beautifully. We reached enough stretch goals. So we added a uh, satin ribbon mm -hmm. and um, two color foil embossing on the cover. And in fact, we're heading towards that right now with the current Kickstarter for Volume 2, we've already added the satin bookmark and we're about halfway to reaching uh, the foil embossed, which will be two colors on the front. Um, wow. And I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll put up the, I'm, I'm sure we'll show everyone the, the Kickstarter at some point in the show. And whereas Volume 1, we had like blue tones and kind of iridescent, this is more hunter green. 
So I envisioned that the uh, the metaphysical part on the logo that was going to be in green, nice. like like an iridescent green, and then the Boston Society will be in silver. Uh, so we're I we're, we still have 17 days left at, at this point. So I think I think we'll make it. We've got about a little over a thousand dollars to go. So I, cautiously optimistic, as they say. Was this a collection of your trade paperbacks into finally a hardcover version, or was this a completely brand new story that you were working on, or stories, I should say? Uh, both actually. Okay. Uh, the volume two compiles our previously published four standalone sequels with art by Gwen Tavares but I also include a new 10 page bonus story that's exclusive to this edition, plus pinup art that probably a lot of people have never seen. Uh, having been around for a while, I've, you know, pinup art has either, sometimes I've commissioned it and sometimes it's just people like, hey, I did this cool thing for you. And I'm like, oh my God, this is beautiful. And, <laughs> and so I've, I've included it and it's, it's kind of nice because I, I let the artists know and, said yeah it's it's been a few years but i'm going to include yours in in this you know beautiful hardback edition you will be immortalized <laughs> <laughs> it's basically like the the best of uh coffee table books what those used to be you know i, I instead of yeah. hanging in the in the shelves you know you could just throw it on the coffee table and make sure that someone uses a coaster <laughs> yes yes always the coaster of which I don't own any, but I don't. I hear other people do. <laughs> That's the one thing I love about this world that you built. The fact that you're looking at the merchandise. You've always had intriguing and interesting merchandise for your backers, for the people that have supported the comic mm -hmm. throughout the years. Here, from pins to bookmarks to the style of your hardcovers, the fact that you're using beautiful colors and embossing and everything. Like you're giving you someone an experience, no matter what they, they pick up. Yeah, I, I try to do that. I, I want every Kickstarter to be an event for it to be special. And uh, in this particular one, we're doing a, a bookmark, uh, like an art deco style owl with both volume one and volume two i've kind of done this owl theme throughout I, I do everything's kind of themed and has to do with something usually within the, the story and the owl was our original logo back in the day and uh so i said okay let's let's repurpose this let's give it a new a fresh look uh and so i hired alejandro lee who i usually do he, he has done a lot of my pins and all of my bookmarks uh, does a wonderful job and uh, I'm not sure when this will be dropping uh, the show will be dropping but I will be doing add-ons of additional uh, color bookmarks that people can add on because right now you just have the copper but I'm going to be adding on brass and uh, black stainless steel okay. so you can either get them individually or you can get the set why this uh, edition of a uh, themed uh, well why do you have the addition of this type of themed merchandise? Is it just something that's set yourself apart from say others that are doing comic crowdfunding campaigns or? That's part of it. And part of it, I just, I just like to do it. <laughs> and originally like the pins and stuff really appealed to my steampunk audience. Uh, because the lapel pins, they've always loved that because if you're cosplaying or going to a steampunk convention or comic con, you can put them on your hat or your lapel. I mean, you can put them anywhere. And I know people who've collected all of them, which is always kind of fun when I see photos of the whole sets come in, uh, that they have them. Uh, but I, I also wanted to do something different other than the lapel pins. And I will have to admit that I stole this idea of the metal bookmarks from Mike Shea, who does Miskatonic High. Yep. Because I saw one of his, this was a few years ago, and I went like, this is great. This is I love this. And so we talk and I asked him where he got it and he told me and the rest the rest is history. So uh, but no, we we all talk about it, you know, did something, you know, different entering stretch stretch goals, reward tiers uh that uh that suit our audience and that we think they'll like. You've had a lot of fan art. You're bringing it into the book. I think that's that's amazing, fascinating uh to see. What has been the reaction to, say, someone that knows that their work is getting put into the book 
you know, maybe it's been a decade or maybe it's been five years since they've last seen it. Do they say, wait, no, I want to redo it. I I have a better style now. Uh, no, they usually just say, oh, wow, thank you. I, you know, had no idea, you know, it, it's great. And I, and I just let them know. And, uh, and this also gives me the opportunity to talk them up on social media because for volume one, we had like Carl Allstetter, Mike Collins and, and others that I got to, say like, hey, we got these wonderful people. And if you know, you didn't see it before, now you can see it. And for volume two, we've got uh, pinups from Roberta and Granada and Ashley Woods and uh, and some from Gwen Tavares, our, our original artist. Um, she had done uh, commissions uh, where she had painted people into the, the pinup art. And, uh, but these are, are the, the, the pinups without the people obviously who had done the commission so they they look really cool and it's a lot of fun to pull all this material together and and everyone's been all the artists have been very supportive the steampunk community has been around for many years now what do you like about seeing the steampunk community embracing boston metaphysical society has anyone cosplayed as any of your characters uh yes a long time ago uh i think maybe once <laughs> but but not a lot i uh, <laughs> It. Uh, I don't think I'm. I'm quite big enough in the world for for that to really happen. Uh, also, to to cosplay in period costume is kind of expensive. <laughs> so yeah, it. There. I think there's a cost uh, in there as well. But yeah, when it did happen, it was it was pretty exciting, and I've certainly had people talk about wanting to cosplay as characters. The fact that you have these various historical figures in, in your actual series itself, I find amazing and fascinating. And you, you learn more about them as the series goes on. But you also kind of have to go down a bit of a rabbit hole in some cases where you learn more about these characters. What is it about the history of the characters that you've put into your series that people would be surprised about? I know with Pike's Peak, uh, I brought Tesla back for that series. And I think they would probably be surprised that he actually smoked for a while and then gave it up because he he realized, I don't know how he realized, but it was bad for him. So he did. And he also was a bit of a gambler back in the day. Wow. And it was a lot of fun to integrate that into the storyline. Um, I mean, that's that's one particular case where it, it actually, you know, it did happen. Uh, other people like Granville T. Woods, there's not a lot of information on him because uh, he was kind of lost to history and to American history. But that also, as a writer, gave me an advantage because he was sort of a blank slate that me as a writer could go and play with. And, and, and that was a lot of fun. So, you know, when people ask me, oh, you have Tesla and Edison in the first six issues, and they said, do they get along? And I'm going like, really? You're asking that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, pretty much it is fiction. Uh, I try to stay thematically accurate to the relationships at the time, mm -hmm. but pretty much you know, everything else is fiction. But you have to have fun with it, too. I mean, you, being a writer, yeah. being a creative person, you, you have those liberties as you've taken them. And you've made a great story in a great world. So I think that's that's Thank something you. that's just timeless. And the fact that you've been doing it for a decade, you know, it's been a, a great journey so far. What else do you have coming up that you're interested in doing that maybe isn't Boston Metaphysical Society? I actually have been working on an outline for an entirely new series. Oh. I'm not announcing it yet. Uh. <laughs> I do have an artist in mind. Uh, he and I have spoken. Um, I really love his work. So he's he's sort of kind of penciled in for next year. Uh, hopefully he won't be too busy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the script still has to be written. I'm, I'm hammering out the fourth issue. It'll be a four issue miniseries. Oh, wow. And I'm about done with the outlining. Uh, but with running the Kickstarter and right. I've had doggy medical issues right. to deal with, it's it's been hard to uh, 
to circle back on that. Is it a freeing experience to work in a new world with a new batch of characters, or is it just another day in the office? Uh, it's a lot of fun to go play, yeah, in, in something else. It's it's like, I may or may not have told you that uh, I also wrote a series for Lady Mechanica. That's been going very slowly. I mean, it's, it's written, but Joe takes his time and all of this, but, but that's okay. I absolutely adored working with uh, Joe and Marsha. Uh, I think he's now working on the art for the second issue, and I think once that's done, I have to ask Marsha. I'm guessing based on their previous Kickstarters that probably early next year they'll run a Kickstarter for that. But uh, I do love playing in other people's sandboxes. That's definitely freeing because I can write the story and say like, here, you deal with production, <laughs> bye. <laughs> Remind the listeners and viewers about that particular series that you just spoke of. Oh, Lady Mechanica? Yeah. It was a creation of Joe uh, Benitz, and I think it has at least six, seven volumes out now. I think the Lady in the Lake was number seven that they just finished, or maybe eight. I have to go back and look, because there was, there was another one before mine. Hmm. There's like Lady in the Lake, and then there was one before mine, and then he was working on, started working on mine. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so it, it's taken a year or, or two to to get down down this road and i understand it's totally fine the campaigns themselves kick, kickstarters are just there's so many out there there's so many different projects so many things but a limited amount of time to get them out there i'm glad that yours is pretty much done i do try to to get to get things done and, and sometimes there are things that are beyond my control uh but yeah, if uh, you are steampunk fans, I highly recommend uh, Lady Mechanica as well. It's very different than Boston Metaphysical. In fact, I had never read any Lady Mechanica when I was first developing Boston Metaphysical because I didn't want any overlap. Yeah. But by the time I came on board to do their story, it was uh, there's absolutely no overlap. There's no relation whatsoever between between the two the art that joe does is very stylistic uh it's about a woman who like woke up when you know has gone through this traumatic experience of like half of her body is now mechanical and she's trying to find out the person who did this to it and did to her and her adventures along the way then and sometimes there are tangents that lead off away from that task and then she comes back to it uh, but great stories, great great humanity in the stories, which I really enjoyed. And uh, I know when I first sat down and, and spoke to Joe and Marsha, uh, it was during the pandemic. Mm. So we were all on Zoom <laughs> and looking pretty ragged by that time. Uh, that we were all on the same page thematically, that we all had the same concerns and themes we wanted to deal with in our writing so i it was a good match no that's good yeah. to hear i'm glad i can't wait to to see it and it's probably me one too of those, <laughs> me too it's one of those series <laughs> i think i have to pick up i just haven't had time <laughs> so i i would highly recommend it they're very good the art of course is fantastic and of course pick up mine when it's oh, yeah. out <laughs> that'll be the first issue i grab rather than you know start at the beginning no i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna get madeline's first for sure <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that the human condition has been lost in terms of comic creators these days, or are people still trying to find a way to create their own stories? Oh, I definitely think people are trying to find a way to create their own stories. I, I think that's even more important now than ever, uh, just because of the, how should I put it, turmoil that we are currently living through, the history we're living through. Uh, we, we never imagined that we would be, you know, you think about history and what other people like, oh, I can't imagine how they lived through that. Well, you know, in about 100 years, they're going to be saying the same thing yeah. <laughs> about us. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, sometimes living through history isn't quite what it's cracked up to be. We can only do so much with the time we have on this, on this world. Yeah, I think people are, are really trying their best to, to get their stories out there. And, and I want them. I mean, I definitely want them to because there's so many interesting stories to tell and I definitely want to listen to them or read them or something. What was the latest literary journey that you've been on? 
literary journey. I do a lot of audio books okay. now because of time and I need to sleep <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so I I actually listen to everything from sana, uh, fantasy to hard sci-fi to high fantasy wow. to um, uh, currently right now I'm almost at the end of uh, and I'm I've never heard her name spoken out loud, so I'm probably going to destroy it. But Tomi Adamayi, or Adimayo, who does who Children of Blood and Bones, and the third book is I think Children of something in Anarchy. I've, I've I would have to go. I, have to, I don't remember. Um, absolutely fabulous. Hmm. Absolutely fabulous. And uh, it's a it's a high fantasy. Nice. Um, set in uh, a mythical Africa okay. and uh, using uh, African folklore as its basis mm -hmm. and just the characters and the conflict is just tremendous. Uh, my understanding that this was picked up to be developed into a movie or TV series before she even published the first one. Oh, wow. I think it's still in development, but you know, development hell, that, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that happens. Yeah. Uh, to everybody, pretty much. Uh, hopefully, they that will come out. It's really a fantastic series. Uh, there's another one called The Grace of Kings by uh, Ken Liu, mm. uh, which is based on um, Asian mythology. And it's what I would call, uh, actually kind of define silk, what's called silk punk, which is a combination of Asian mythology and themes with technology hmm. but set in a fantasy past and I have to say it they called the drag they did have dragons in there but they called them Garanopins right. but it was the first time I'd ever read or heard a battle between dragons and airships <laughs> it was freaking fantastic Wow! it was and what was even better was all the characters were really smart. Nice. So they kept one upping each other. And so you're like, oh my God, what are they going to do next? What are they going to do next? What are they going to do next? And you have battlefield commanders who are just on it and who can change on a dime. Yeah. And wow, it was just, it's really, tr really tremendous. Uh, I, I always talk about that, but yeah, it kind of, started the whole silk what they call silk punk nice. um but yeah i listened to a lot of that but probably my old time favorite audiobook over the last uh, 10 years would be um martha wells's murderbot diaries oh, okay and that's sci-fi that is actually being made into a tv a live action tv series wow. which i think is going to be amazing they've already cast at least part of it um, if, if anyone is new and have never dabbled into science fiction at all, I would start with the Murderbot Diaries because it's very, it's very contemporary in its outlook. It's funny as all get out. And, uh, it's, you know, it's not really dense. Um, so I, most people can wrap their heads around it. It's not like reading Dune or Hyperion or something right, like that, yeah. which, you know, you you kind of be have the hardcore sci-fi. A little heavy for the first time. <laughs> yeah, it's a little heavy for the first time. But if if you're brand new, yeah, and and they've won everything from the Hugo to the oh. Lotus to the Nebula to I mean everything, everything. Okay. I really admire Martha Wells. She started out as she's a fantasy writer, uh, and she's been one for quite a long time. And she started seeing her her career start to degrade oh. and over time with her fantasy books. And then she was thinking like, you know, this may be it. Because, you know, she got the three book deal and the two book deal and the one book mm -hmm. deal. And you see the handwriting on the wall. Yeah. She came up with the Murderbot Diaries. And these are primarily novellas with a few novels in between. Okay. And her agent's going like, oh, yeah, these should probably do well. This is great. They like blew up. <laughs> And they completely redefined her career. Nice. She got new six figure, you know, six book deals. It completely invigorated everything. Uh, marvelous writer, but 
yeah, if if you have not listened or read the Murder Bot Diaries, yeah, you need to go do that. I actually haven't, um, but now now yeah. I'm going to. This is going to this is now a, a check mark on on the list. So there you go. Talk about the Kickstarter campaign. Let me pull it up real quick here. Sure. Uh, See, that's the new add-ons. The uh, you can order three of the Art Deco style owl metal bookmarks. How many stretch goals we've we've reached? As of that's a mock-up of our obviously our cover, the book, the hardcover, with the the covers done by Claudia and Ancielo. And uh, yeah, you can get a hardback, you can get a softback. There's a digital level as well. We have like a, a, a basic digital level, or you can get both volumes for digital. You can get a, a comic bundle digital, uh, and then all of the uh, physical rewards include uh, domestic or U.S. Uh, postage. Um, and then our starter kit, I always have a starter kit you see there. That's for folks who are brand new to the series and also like pros, but want to get the, you know, the pretty cover soft back of volume one of the special edition. And what's nice about this is that you get your prose fix, you get your graphic novel fix, but the two, when you read them together, provide you with the, the foundation for the entire series. Do you like writing prose better than comics sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little more freeing, but I like, I like doing both. And then that's our, uh, our digital comics and prose bundle where you can get all of our current stuff in digital and also the the novel and the anthology yeah and you can get both of the softbacks and that also includes the pdfs and those are the covers uh, on the i guess my left there of the four standalone sequels that are in this uh, volume two great names by the way i've always loved your namings oh thank you and then the premium digital package includes everything plus the um, a digital download of the audio drama. These images here. That's from Scourge, the first three pages of The Scourge of the Mechanical Men. The art there is by Gwen Tavares. And that's the first page of our bonus story with art by Claudia Balboni. It's called The Ghost Collector. I was going to have a special thing with that owl, but it didn't, it didn't work out. So maybe later. <laughs> what, was it going to be a plushie or something? I, I thought the plushie would be done in time, and, it, and it's not. So that will be for another campaign. Okay. Yeah, and you get the first two issues. You can get, you can get the first. That's the, obviously the cover of the audio drama, and then we do have the first two issues available for Mystery at Pikes Peak, and that's all the. Yeah, that's all the tiers. Uh, unfortunately, we're way past the early bird special time. <laughs> Those are in the first three days, so. Yeah, I'm afraid folks have missed that. We have a, a nothing but books packages because I know some people are just not so and just like to have hold all the books, have everything. And uh, that includes the hardback uh, and the, the softbacks of the novel and the anthology, the coloring book, um, all sorts of great things. The everything package as well, basically everything. <laughs> uh, we, we possibly have, not quite everything, almost everything. Uh, they get the hardbacks, the two prose books, you get uh, PDFs of uh, two short stories, the lapel pins, the coloring book, the CD and the flash drive, a whole bunch of stuff. Lots and lots of goodies, plus the, uh, the 12 additional digital comics uh, if you pledge to a reward. If you are bored with everything else you've read, this is the perfect time to jump in with absolutely <laughs> everything that... that... Madeline has created so <laughs> operators are standing by <laughs> uh, is there anything that I haven't touched on you'd like to share uh, about yourself or the comics or anything along that line that you know those that are watching and listening to this interview should know about if you like paranormal and gas lamp fantasy and steampunk and character driven comics then Boston of Metaphysical Society is, is definitely for you we uh we have a lot of fun. I do try to uh, include. I try to, if this if there's science in a story, I try to make it accurate. If I can, I can't always do that. Uh, but uh, sometimes the story takes precedent. But it's it's a good ride and it's it's a lot of fun. 
and you have fun doing it and I know we have fun reading it that's the main thing so may you have this series for another 10 years or so or whenever you'd like to eventually stop it but I think it'll be on everyone's lexicon for many years to come for sure <laughs> well thank you very much I do hate to say this Madeline but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks <laughs> Talking thank you so much for coming back on the show and you're always welcome back anytime for sure well thank you very much for having me so where can we find you? How can we support you? And anything else you'd like to promote, just to kind of wrap things up? Uh, right now, we'll be on Kickstarter for the Volume 2 Special Edition, and you can also get the Volume 1 Special Edition as well until October 31st of 2024. Uh, you can also find me on uh, our website, uh, either top in, type in Boston Metaphysical Society or Queen of Mercia. That's my company name. It all goes to the same spot. I'm on Facebook at Boston Metaphysical Society Comic, uh, Twitter now known as X, uh, as M Holly Rosing, Instagram is M Holly One. But pretty much, if you just go to any search engine and type in Boston Metaphysical, you'll be able to find me. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T W O, not the number two. Website's going through a complete revamp. You can find all of these, though, definitely at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast you can find at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.